Thank you for joining our broadcast today at City Life Church. We would love to hear how God is using this ministry to change your life. So please take a moment to send us your story at info at citylifechurch.cc. And if God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, we want to encourage you to partner with us financially to help us to bring God's word to our people. You can go to our website at citylifechurch.cc to find the giving options that work best for you. We've got an encouraging word for you, and we pray that you lean in and engage as we head into the auditorium for today's message. It's great to see you today. Man, take your seat. I'm honored to be here all the way from uh, St. Louis. And, you know, um, normally when I come, I'm always telling you about a new baby we've had. But you've had a new baby in Wesley Chapel today. Isn't that exciting? I mean, a brand new campus. Now, let me say to you this. Um, the Bible uh, tells us that um, the church is the bride of Christ. And there is nothing that I treasure more than my bride. So imagine how much God trusts you with the fact that he's given you his bride in Wesley Chapel. I mean, that's extraordinary that he has chosen you. And so your response is very important. Listen, he, he didn't give that to just pastors Tony and Casey, who we love, to your staff. He gave it to you. The church is not a, a, a walls, it's, it's you. And so right now is the season for you to serve, to get planted. It's for you to invite. Somebody told me something's going on next week. What's next week? Easter, that's right. There are people in your life who need to know Christ. And the only thing keeping them from hearing that message is your invite. So I want you this week to be intentional about, about uh, you know, Facebook them, text them, throw back to MySpace them if you've got to, whatever you need to do. I want you to make sure you're, some folks are with you next week at one of these three campuses because God's going to do amazing, amazing things. Um, who's excited for the word today? I'm excited. Let's get into it. Um, I want you to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 4. And, um, and here's what we're going to do. I am going to speak on a huge topic, okay? Um, this topic is so big that it is the cause for any trouble you see in the world. So, so any trouble you see on the news, any trouble that you're having in your home, any trouble that you, you are having at work, it traces back to this topic. This is a huge topic that can be described in one tiny word. I want to talk to you about sin. Sin. Okay, and I, want, I know Pastor just had this book come out, The Door to More. Um, I hope you've gotten your copy. I heard he's already sold out of them. Um, but today I want to talk to you about the dangers of an open door. The dangers of an open door. Because sin is something that we very much misunderstand. Today, everybody's got an opinion on it. Culture's trying to redefine it. But if we want to live with God's blessing, we have to realize this place we call our world is really his world. And so we have to have his view on everything, including sin. All right, so um, last spring, I decided I wanted to get in shape. And um, I do this almost every spring. Maybe you're the same. And when I decided I wanted to get in shape, it means I've got to clean out all the junk food. I'm not one of these people that can have Oreos in the house and they not end up in me. So, so we clean out every drawer, every cookie, every candy, all of it's got to go. And I started, uh, so we went through that and then I started running and I was on a run. I was a couple weeks in and I was on a run and it was going really well. And all of a sudden I started hearing this noise. And, and, and have you ever heard something and you're like, what is that? And you just can't put your finger on it. So I was running and I kept hearing this noise. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, that noise was the music from an ice cream truck. <laughs> it was in the neighborhood where I was running. Now the chubby part of me went, woohoo. But the determined part of me knew we better get the chubby part of me out of here. So, so I start running in a direction that I think is in the opposite of this, this truck, but the music doesn't go away. As a matter of fact, it starts getting louder. It's like Jaws, dun 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 And all of a sudden, I look back, and the truck is coming down the same street I'm running on. Now, now listen, at this point, I'm running, I'm sweating, the music's blaring, and, and I'm getting desperate. I start quoting scripture. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in that truck. I, 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 every truck raised up against me is going to fall. I will resist the truck and the truck will flee. I mean, I'm doing all I can. 
But, but listen, the guy that drove that truck, he was a pro. He knew. You don't get behind somebody that looks like me and not know they're good for a Klondike bar. So he just waited out the determined part of me till the chubby part of me turned around and went right back to his truck. Now here's what I'm gonna tell you. If you're gonna start running, it's more enjoyable if you do it with a Klondike bar. That's all I'm saying, okay? Now listen, the reason I tell you that story is this. Um, it feels like sometimes as believers, people who honestly want to follow Jesus with their life, it feels like that sometimes sin just tracks us down. I mean, we've all done things and said things that we just regret. Things that the moment you did them or said them, you go, why? How do I always end up here? Why do I always do that? Why, why do I, I'm stuck in this cycle. If you've ever asked those questions, I want to shine some light on it from James chapter one, verse 13. This is Jesus' brother writing about the way sin works. He says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to, help me with this word, sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So um, in these just couple of verses, there's a whole lot about sin that we don't understand. One of the first things that he notes is this, that God never invites us into sin. There are people who think that God's kind of this cosmic crank and that he likes to set up all of the boundaries and then entice us to come over them so that he can drop the hammer on us. But the reality is this, no one hates sin more than God hates sin because sin has cost no one more than it's cost God. Sin ruined his world. It wrecks the lives of those he loves, you and I, and it's so costly that it costs him the, the life of his own son. So God would never invite you into something that he hates so much. James is also telling us though that when sin is working in our lives, that sin has a destination in mind, an agenda. He says that sin grows like a child, it matures, so it takes time, but its goal is to end in death. That sin is a process and its end game is death. Now death in scripture doesn't always mean physically dead. It doesn't mean the minute you sin, the minute you physically die. What it means is, is that sin is a direction, not just a destination. That there's this, this idea that when you step out of God's ways, you step out of life and you start down a road that will eventually end in death. It's a process. It's something that works over time, compounding to wreck our lives. And it's something that should not be tolerated. Because what he's warning us is this, though sin appears to be something that can be welcomed you, an innocent, almost like a baby, you need to know it's going to end in death. Leave sin long enough in your marriage, it will kill your marriage. Leave sin long enough in your career, it will kill your career. Leave sin in any place, it will eventually destroy, steal, and kill, because that's just what sin does. So with this idea, though, there is this concept that sin, though, brings death, it needs a door to begin its process. And, and many of us don't under, fully understand this because we think we just are what we are. Like, I, I'm like my mom, she was like this, her mom was like this, I've always struggled with this, this addiction is just who I am. And we actually think sin masters us, but that's not the case. Reality is you're in a process with sin, but you gave it access through a door. God introduces this concept in Genesis chapter four. Um, after Adam and Eve have sinned and, and, in the, and the, the virus of sin has infected the whole world, they have two children, Cain and Abel. Cain is considering sinning by killing his brother Abel in anger. So God has a conversation with, with Cain that kind of brings some ideas about sin and the way that it controls or doesn't control our life. Genesis 4, 7, it says, if this is God speaking to Cain, if you do well, which means you believe me and you do what's acceptable and pleasing to me. So he's saying, if you stay within this path of life I've created, he says, you're going to be accepted. But if you do not do well, meaning you ignore my instructions, notice sin crouches at the door. Its desire is to overpower you, but you must master it. So the idea of, hey, Cain, it doesn't matter what your mom was like. It doesn't matter what you think you can't control. 
Sin is at the door of your life and you choose if it gets to come in or not. That, 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 that sin cannot barge in, it cannot overtake, it must be at given access and the way you live, Cain, determines if access is given to sin in your life. So here's what I wanna do today. I've found five steps that sin is trying to take you and I through in order to bring death. And, and I wanna center them around the imagery of this door because I want to encourage some folks today who think that sin is their master, that he, it is not because of the work of Jesus. As we began this Palm Sunday and announcing Jesus is coming, the reason he came is to overcome sin so that you and I can overcome sin. So I want, I want to show this to you. Here's the first step as we look at the door being open to sin. Here's the first one. Sin customizes its invitation. James starts off with saying, hey, that, that, that what, where sin begins is not in death, it begins in our desires. That before we can ever begin the process, there has to be something we desire that's outside of God's will for us. So in essence, he says that, that your, your desires are represented by the door. Now here's what's interesting. It doesn't say that sin comes with the same door to everyone. It says everybody's got a door, but the doors are unique. Here's what he's saying, your desire or your door may not be desirable to me, but it's desirable to you. Whereas my door may not be a temptation to you, but it's a temptation to me. So, so the reality is though, we all have a door. Some of you are here today and your door is overspending. Like, like you have no self-control, semi-annual sales, Amazon, credit cards, that's, that's your door. And some of you are here and it's a substance. It's a night in the club, it comes in a needle, a bottle, a bag, but, but you're, you're pulled to that door. Some people are here and it's lust. You look too long at people in the gym, you've got an OnlyFans account, you hook up one night at a time because you, 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 that's your door. Listen, for church folks, um, oftentimes it's not, that those things aren't their door. A lot of times church folks, it's the way they treat other people. Like, like, like they're critical is their door. They walked in here today, somebody walked in here today, you already found nine things you don't like about this church. Nobody's pointing out this is your ninth church either, but you know, whatever. <laughs> hey, some, some, some Christians are judgmental. You know, when, when I said today I'm gonna talk about sin, you know what your first thought was? Thank God so-and-so's here. They need to hear this, that old sinner. Because that's your door, that's your door. That's just the way, we, we've all got a door. Nobody's without a door. The question is, are you aware of your door? Are you, are you aware of your door? Because if I become aware of my door, then I can arrange my life to miss my door. Like, like some of you, your first step is to ask yourself, where am I when I always walk through the door? Who am I with when I normally go through this door? How do I feel usually before I end up going through a door? And those questions are gonna lead to a very powerful principle, which is this, you can defeat tomorrow's temptation by deciding today, I ain't going near that door. Yeah. Now, now listen, I have decided that personally. Listen, I have decided I will not go through the door of sexual immorality. I'm tired of watching documentaries, I'm tired of hearing about another pastor that's fallen, and I'm not gonna be one of those people. I'm not gonna be one of those that ruins my marriage and ruins my ministry. I love doing this, and I love doing it with you, and I love doing it with the folks in St. Louis, so I, I know what my door is. Listen, I, my phone doesn't do what your phone does. I can't get on what you get on. I can't download the apps you get on. Listen, I'm so committed to not, if somebody even whistles at me, I won't turn my head, because I am committed to not going through that door. Listen, all I'm saying is this, you got a door. You got a door. And some of you hear me say that about my life and you go, well, pastor, my gosh, you must be weak. I'm not weak. I'm aware. I'm aware that I, just because I have a title doesn't mean I don't have a door. And so I've got to do whatever it takes today to determine not to fight this door in the future. And so I'll do whatever it takes because I'm not going to go through that door. Listen, some of you need to buy into the truth today. You are not mastered by sin. Sin has to have you open the door. It has to be given access by you. You are the one that has to open the door to sin, and if you don't want it, you can shut it. You don't have to live slave to a door. But you gotta be aware of it. Now, after, let's assume, though, that you're not aware of your door. That means the second step is this, that all of a sudden, when you, you notice your door, you start getting drawn to your door, that, that all of a sudden, there's a, a calling 
of God's goodness into question. That's the second step. That all of a sudden, mind games start with the enemy. That he starts planting thoughts in your mind that tell you, namely, happiness is on the other side of this door. If you buy this, you're going to feel more confident. If you take this, you're going to have more peace. If you date them, you're going to feel truly loved. And all of a sudden, he says, happiness is on the other side of this door, but that's only one half of the lie. Here's the other half of the lie. Happiness is on the other side of this door. Huh, why wouldn't God want you to go through that door? All of a sudden, he says, happiness is over there, and for some reason, God doesn't want you to have it. Maybe God doesn't have your best interest in mind. And all of a sudden, those thoughts start to consider, well, maybe God doesn't have my best interest in mind. Maybe he doesn't care about me. Maybe he doesn't love me. Maybe all those scriptures aren't true. And you start to entertain a lie. Because here's what the enemy knows. You have to doubt the goodness of God before you'll disobey the will of God. You have to first think God's not good before you'll start stepping outside of, of his truth. Now, now listen, every time you've ever went through this door, it's first because you believed a lie. No one, it's, now I don't know what your lie was. Maybe everybody's going through the door. Just go. Listen, you go through a door, it's your choice, your life, your truth, it doesn't matter. All right, it's just your door, it doesn't affect other people. I don't know what lie you believed, but I know you had to believe a lie because a lie makes disobedience viable, okay? That's the reason Jesus said in John 8, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus says you don't know any freedom until you know truth, okay? So, so, so let me say it this way. You cannot control every thought the enemy throws in your head, but you do control the framework of truth with which that lie arrives in. And I'm concerned because in America today, Bible literacy is at an all-time low. Less people are reading the Bible than ever before, which means less people have God's framework of truth. So let me ask you this. If you don't know the truth, how do you know when you're, you're receiving a lie? It takes one to contrast with the other. The reason that we see the, 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 the bondage and the difficulty, the depression, the, 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 the despondency that exists today is we're taking in lies as though they're truth. Culture will celebrate your lie. A crowd will cheer you right through a lie. Your circumstances will validate you taking a step into a lie. Only God's truth corrects a lie. And that is the reason Psalm 119 says, I have banked your truth in my heart that I might not sin against you. Banked. It didn't, oh, I love that word. Here's what it's implying. It's something I stored before because by the time my hand is on the handle, it's too late. You ain't going to find a verse by the time your hand's on the handle. Listen, you, you're ready to let them have it online. You're not looking for a verse then. You're in the, you know, the chemistry's begun between you and the other person. You're not going to be looking for a verse then. You're already in the, it's already getting crazy. You're not looking for a verse then. It's banked. And the reason so many people don't have victory is because they're banked, rupt when it comes to God's word. There's nothing there. The, the scriptures tell us this, that the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance the things we've stored in our heart. Guess what? He can't bring anything to remembrance if you haven't stored anything. If you've not put his word in daily through a Bible reading plan, you've not opened the scriptures and taken them in. You say, yeah, but pastor, I, don't, I just don't understand it. I just get confused. You don't need to understand it for it to be banked. When you need to understand it, the Holy Spirit will teach you what it says. He'll show you. And it's going to be when your hand's on the door and you're about to walk into death, he'll say, nope, that's what this verse means. And all of a sudden, a verse becomes victory because listen, it's still, I know it's old fashioned, but the Bible is still true. Let call Culture be made a liar. I don't care what they redefine, what they say. Listen, God's word outlasts every lie and every trend. It's still the only thing that leads to life and away from death. We need God's word in our lives every single day. Listen, it ain't a chore to read the Bible. It's the way you win this war. And so you got, you got to have it because otherwise, otherwise, hey, you're just taking it a lie. Okay, let's assume that you have no truth though. No truth leads to step number three, which is sin goes under consideration. So you've bought into the lie, and now you're, you're lingering, mulling over the lie. Sin needs a partner, though. It can't open the door. You've got to open the door. So what the partner looks like is first maybe rationalization. 
you know what, what's it matter if I take a little bit of their money? They got plenty of money. She's treated me wrong for years. I deserve. Sometimes it's not rationalization. Sometimes it's negotiation. It's, now I'm not going to go through this door. <laughs> but I'm going to get about as close as you can. I'm not in, I'm not through the door. It's just one comment, one image. Religion loves this. It loves seeing how close you can get to the door, and technically you're not through the door. And sometimes the one we don't recognize, but I think is actually the most common is this. Sin's partner is exhaustion. Um, Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger, for it gives an open door to your spiritual enemy. Here's what it's telling us, that you and I were made to only um, hold negative emotions for a short period of time. You're not supposed to live with grief, live with anxiety, live with anger, live with wounds that go unhealed. You're, you're just not made for it. And the longer it lingers, the more you run exhausted emotionally. And your emotional exhaustion becomes a partner in opening the door to your spiritual enemy. I felt like in prayer that many of you are here today and this is where you're at risk. You're discouraged and you've been discouraged too long. You've been dis discontented too long. You've been grieving, you've been wounded, it's been difficult and it's been so long that, that you're tired. Now I'm not telling you it didn't happen and I'm not saying, How, come on, snap out of it. I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be um, uncaring. But I am telling you that, listen, you know how to rest your body. You better learn how to rest your soul. Proverbs 4, 23 says this, carefully guard the source of your life. Carefully guard. You know what it didn't say? Carefully get a security system. Okay, catch this. A security system is something. A guard is someone. Carefully guard. Get some people that when you're tired or not thinking straight or, or, or getting ready to take a step, that they will put themselves in front of the door and say, I'm not letting you go through there because I care too much about what God's doing in your life. Now, now listen, this is why you need a group. This is why you need to be on a team. This is why you got to be more than an audience. You got to plant in this church. Okay, this is why. Because you need somebody in your life you can come to and go, hey, I'm taking off the mask. I'm about to walk through the door. I'm about to, to walk out of this marriage. I'm about to walk into this substance. And, and, and here's what they're, you say, well, well, listen, they don't have all the answers. You're right. The person here is not guarding in the fact that they can fix you. What they're allowing you to do is unload so you don't have to let that stuff linger any longer. They're going to say, hey, talk it through with me. Talk to me about how you're feeling. Talk to me about what you're tempted in. Talk to me about what, what's it been like. I, I don't have all the answers, but I can let you unload it so that the peace of God can take residence again in your heart. You know, the, the problem is we have a sin issue in the church. The issue is not that we sin. The issue is we're unwilling to talk about it. Could you imagine going to a mechanic for your car not operating correctly? You walk in and, and, and he says, hey, great to see you. Um, what's the problem? And you're going, well, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I, I just, I, I feel uncomfortable sharing. It's an unspoken request. <laughs> hey, because well, I can't help you. Because you must disclose in order for me to do a work. Listen, I, want, I, I don't know how long you've been in this church, but I'm going to tell you, I know church. This is a place of grace. We checked every person at the door today. We're all sinners. Every single one. No perfect people here. And that's what uniquely makes this a great place for people to go, hey, I got issues too. Unload yours and then I'll unload mine because I'm not going to let you go through this door. God's got too big a plan and too big a purpose for me to let you. I'm your guard. You, I got you. You're not going through this door. But, but let's assume, let's assume, let's assume that you, you've bought in, you, you didn't do anything to stay away from the door, you, you, don't, you bought into the lie, you don't have anybody in your life, well, all that's left at this point is sin is going to be carried out.
well, it's not so bad in here. This is actually kind of fun. Listen, this, if anybody ever preaches to you that sin's not fun, they're lying. Sin's fun. It's fun to gossip about other people and feel better about myself. It, it's fun to, to, to live loose and play hard. It's fun to falsify a report and get some extra cash that ain't mine. It's fun for a season. Because remember, there's a process. The problem most of us have is we step into sin, and, and, and the enemy's so good at this, he sells the product but not the price. Right, right? He said, oh, that looks good on you. You're going to have so much fun with that. Have you ever bought something like that? Like you love this thing. They've talked you into this thing. And then right before you go to the register, you say, how much does that cost? And they tell you, and you're like, I can't afford that. That's, that's what's happening in this moment. You've come in here, and, and, and you're buying in to the fun, but you don't realize there's a cost. What's the cost? This is the cost. The Bible says that um, God's voice is a still, small voice. Okay, it's not a loud, booming voice. So what this implies is, is that God has chosen to speak to his people in a tone that requires them to be close. Can you imagine how hard it is to hear a whisper through a door? It, it's just, it's muffled. I can't, it, it's not clear. I can't catch the tone. It, it's, it's, it, it's, I, I can't get it. The cost of living in sin is not your salvation. You don't, you, we don't walk back and forth through salvation. You're still saved. The cost was your spiritual sensitivity. That all of a sudden, you can't hear the voice that brings life as clear as you once did. Now, what, 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 what's happened for some of you, listen, listen, is the first time you stepped over here, you thought, I ain't supposed to be here. I can, like, there was a rattling on the inside of you. And it was the Holy Spirit's convicting. He was saying, you, you don't belong in here. And you, you went back. But then you went through the process again and again and again until now what once was a rattling is barely a pinch. You've become what Scripture says is you've given a seared heart. You've spent so much time in sin, you're deaf to the Holy Spirit. And you're living over here thinking there's no cost, but there is because you can't hear his voice. Because listen, hey, the same voice that says stop is also the voice that brings success. Let, let, let me say it this way. You can't cut off the convicting voice and still have the comforting voice. That there has been a searing of your heart. And here's what the enemy knows. In order to lead you to death, he first has to lead you away from life. So, so, so listen, here's what he does. He puts you in a position where God's volume decreases and his volume increases to where you hear your spiritual enemy more clear than you hear your father. And the reason why is because in step five, he flips the script. Sin convinces you there is no way out. Isn't it so interesting how sin works? On this side, it said, it's gonna be so much fun and on this side, it calls you an addict. On this side, it promised everything you wanted. And on this side, it disparages you and tells you that you are no longer loved by God. Wow. Isn't it interesting how the same voice that invites you is now the voice that incarcerates you? That it promised satisfaction over here, but now it looks at you and says, you are so messed up. You are so bound. You could never go back through this door. You could never, he, he's not even on the other side of this door anymore. You, you might as well just live here and die because there's no life there for you anymore. Wow. Now listen, listen. He says, on this side, there's freedom over here. But when you get over here, he claims now you're his slave. Yeah. Claims. The thing you gotta know about the enemy is, if he's talking, he's lying. Because the Bible says his natural tongue is lies. I read an article about Harry Houdini. He was an a escape artist. Maybe you've heard his name before. Um, he would escape from chains and handcuffs, contraptions. It was a form of entertainment. And one of his shticks is he would go to a city and he would claim in the town square, there's not a cell in this 
town that can hold me. And so they would put him into a jail cell, they'd lock the door, and then, um, and then he, would, he would do what he does, and he would escape, and he'd come out and say, I told you. And it was kind of something he did to, to build fanfare. It worked in every city but one. He went to a city, he made the claim, they put him into the jail cell, and when the jailer shut the door, they went away, and he went through the motions as usual. He held a small piece of metal behind his belt, he pulled it out, and he began to use his vast knowledge as a, as a locksmith to start working on the lock. Normally it took him no more than 30 minutes, but on this particular day, 30 minutes passes, 45 minutes passes, an hour passes, an hour and a half passes, two hours, and he cannot get this cell door open. He finally waves the white flag. Everybody is celebrating because now the great Houdini has been captured. It's on front, front page news. It so bothered him, the damage to his reputation, that he went back and did an autopsy of what happened. This has worked everywhere. What happened? Here's what happened. Turns out that when the jailer shut the door, he forgot to lock it. And so Harry Houdini was trying to unlock something that was already unlocked. Turns out the only place that that was actually locked was in his mind. I heard the Holy Spirit say this morning, there's some people who came to City Life Church and you think you're bound in an addiction. You think this attitude's always gonna be that you think that there is no way out of your sin. Jesus announced in John 8, I am the door. All that want to come through, come on through. Because 2,000 years ago on a cross, I moved out of the way sin and its problem. My resurrection took the keys from the enemy and I through the Holy Spirit have given you the keys to the kingdom. There's no addiction, there's no sin, there's no bondage that I have not made a way through. Come all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest and in a way to abundant and eternal life. Sin cannot lock what I have unlocked and you can walk out anytime you want. That's what we're talking about today. That's what's offered. And his promise endures. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful. He is not, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he, come on, set on he for just a second. Not, not strong wills will make a way. Not disciplined people will make a way. Not the latest trend will make a way. Not if you try hard enough, it'll make a way. Not if your church attendance is good enough, it'll make a way. He, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life is the only way. He'll make a way. What is this way? It's an old word that, if you've been around church, you may remember, it's the word repentance. Repentance in a word gets said too much anymore, and I think it's because we perceive it as the preacher telling me how bad I am and making me feel bad enough to take a step. That's not repentance, though. In the Greek, the word repentance it's so simple. It just, it, it, it kind of just means to make your view God's view. So, so let, let me show you repentance. You ready? Yeah. That's repentance. Now, so, so, so it's too simple. Some of you didn't get it. It's so simple. You Greek scholars out there. This is repentance. I decide that this way is no longer my way, and his way is now my way, and I just walk through it. That's all repentance is. Now let me, let, 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 me point, let me point out something. Let me point out something. Repentance is not praying harder. Do you know how many people I know who have a great prayer life while being bound in sin? Because repentance is not prayer, and prayer is not repentance. Um, repentance is not feeling sorry for what you've done. I hate to break it to you, but your tears don't wash away sin. Only Jesus' blood does that. And we've got people today that the enemy has convinced through self-hate, and, 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 and you're so disgusted with yourself that you're actually compounding on the problem because your tears aren't going to do anything spiritually. Repentance is not... Getting religion. Listen, I spent years attending church and attending to an addiction. 
there are people in this room today that you're here and you're here faithfully, but you're a slave to sin, a slave to an appetite, an addiction, an association, an attitude. There ain't enough religion that can stop sin. Repentance is me choosing no longer this way, but his way. But, but, but listen, it's more than that. Because some of you have repented to this point. Okay, look at this. This is, this is, I'm telling you, this is for somebody. You're on this side, but you, all your time, all your focus, all your energy is fighting this door. Oh, I don't want to go to the door. I don't want to go to the door. I almost went to the door this week. I was so worried about the door. And I, I'm telling you, I can't be near anybody. Like, I live in my house, and I don't talk to people. I don't have internet. I, all I do is look at the cat because I'm afraid I'll go through the door. <laughs> Listen, that's what, that's what we think. We, our whole life becomes about managing the door. I live this way. That Everything's about this door. I, mean, I, I used to be a door. I went through the door. I, I'm worried about the door. I'm on the verge of the door all the time. Who wants to spend their life fighting a door? At some point, you get so tired of focusing on the door that you just give up and go, I must, I must just be destined for the door. You know what the answer is? Don't stop here. Stop fighting a door and fall in love with Jesus. The focus is no longer a door. The focus is his mercy and his grace and his goodness and his kindness. And I become so enthralled with him, so encapsulated by him that he becomes my obsession that, that I don't even care about a door because I've got him, that I don't even worry about that old life because I've got him and, and that he's so much better than what used to be. And what happens is the more you run this way, the further the door gets. But also there's a work in you and in your mind, the less you want the door. I know people me, who used to desire the door, and now I could walk past it and not even be worried about it because I so desire him. The key is to fall in love with Jesus, not fight a door. I want to show you a picture of repentance as we end today. This is my 10-year-old son, Sawyer. Last year, I got to baptize him. We waited till he was 10 because we wanted to make sure he knew it wasn't a ceremony. It was a significant moment, spiritual things happen. He came out of the water and that's the face he showed me. <laughs> now listen, that night I went to his room and I, I figured that I was gonna have to explain some things and close some gaps. I said, hey buddy, what are you thinking about today? He said, dad, it's the happiest day of my life. Now listen, and this is what he said, 10 years old. A decade of my disobedience has been washed away. Now listen, listen. In that moment, a great spiritual truth set up in my heart that no one is too young for the enemy to enslave. And no one is too young for Jesus' grace to open a way. If a 10-year-old can conceive walking through a door. There's not a person here, there's not a bondage here that cannot be overcome by the exact same step. I want you to stand to your feet today. This is a holy moment. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Just to, just to put out any distractions, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. Particularly, there's a group of people, you're here today and there's something going on in your heart. Sometimes messages get stuck in our ears, but today it's undenied that it's in your heart. You've been moved, you've been challenged. Something in you is responding to the things that God is saying. I'm gonna put money on it that it's because he's calling you to follow him. To truly become a follower of Jesus. Now, pastor, hold on, hold on. I, I, my mama was a deacon, and I've been in church most of my life. Awesome. But that's religion. That's not following Jesus. Only following Jesus transforms us. Only saying, Jesus, my way doesn't work. My pursuits don't work. I'm fully going all in with you. I'm pursuing you. I don't understand it all, but I understand enough that I cannot do it on my own. I desperately need you to do a work in me. 
Some of you are here today and you, you wouldn't even say that you're assured of a daily relationship with Christ. You wouldn't even be assured of, of eternal. Like if you, you pass today, you don't, you don't know where you would be. You're just, there's uncertainty. And I'm just telling you, a relationship's not uncertain. I know I'm married to Kayla, even though she's not in the state of Florida. And if you don't have certainty today and the Holy Spirit's pressing on your heart, it's because he's choosing, he's, he's drawing you to follow him. So I want to pray for you. I don't want to embarrass you, but I, 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 this means so much to me. I want to put a face with the prayer. So if we could do this, if you're here today and you're making a decision, Pastor Joe, pray for me. I'm choosing to follow Christ. I'm choosing to follow Christ. Let's do this. I want you to raise your hand high so I can see your face before I pray for you. Pastor Joe, pray for me today. Come on, I'm in, high. I'm going to look at every one of you. High. Pastor Joe, pray for me today. I see that hand and that hand and that one 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 and that one. And this one, and this one, and this, and those three. Yep, and you, you, yep, yep. I see both of you right there. I want to see your faces. Yep, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Yes, ma'am, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, I see you, 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 I see you. I'm seeing every one of you. I see you, I see you. God sees you, God sees you. God bless you. I see you, I see you there, I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you, I see you, I see you. Come on, I know this is taking time, but it means something to me. Yes, you, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I see you wave at me. I see you, there you are. I see you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All the way to the back, I see you. I see you. I see you, sir. All the way back there, I see you. I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. Yes, yes. But all three of you right there. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Sir, I see you. Yep, you. You. Right there you are. I see you. You're not lost. I see you, too. I see you, too. I see you, ma'am, all the way up here. Now, if that's you, I'm going to pray for you, but here's what I want to do. I want you to pray with me. There's nothing magical about these words, but they're just putting... They're putting some words to what's going on in your heart right now. So I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I'm choosing you. I no longer choose my way. I no longer choose sin. I choose Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. You can have my whole life. I want to know you daily and eternally. I receive you today in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every one of them, every one of them right now. May they know the rich mercy of God. May every stain of sin be washed away. May they understand now the incredible grace and the inexhaustible love of Jesus. May every lie be undone, pulled down and broken in the truth of your presence. And may Holy Spirit of God, you move in and take up residence closer than any person they know. May you speak to them daily May they have your ear and may you have theirs. May, Father, though it is a still small voice, it be clear and loud in their spirit. May it cause them to step in the steps you've ordered. May you bring people around them to encourage them. And may, Holy Spirit of God, you cause them to experience the love of God. And how high and how deep and how wide it is. Lord, I pray most of all, most of all, may they never, ever, 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 ever be the same in Jesus' name. May their biochemistries and their mental wirings be redone in your presence. May addictions drop, appetites change, attitudes altered, and may it set a new course for a generation of people. May they be born again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, City Life. Let's celebrate some people coming to Jesus today. Thank you again for joining us for today's broadcast. Our prayer is that it ministered to you and it changed your life. If there's anything we can pray with you about or God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, please send us an email to info at citylifechurch.cc. We want to invite you to be our guest at one of our Sunday or Wednesday worship experiences. And you can find our times and locations on our website at citylifechurch.cc. You can also download our City Life Church app on your smartphones or tablets for more online messages. It was great having you with us today, and we'll see you next time.